Victoria Shrove is one of the first and longest serving animal law practitioners in Canada and the first animal law lawyer in Western Canada to have a focus on animal law for 20 years. She, will work, uh, she still works as a lawyer as well as an educator. Victoria will comment on competing norms of elevating companion animals' rights to more closely align with those of child versus uh, the prevailing ownership model in the context of dissolution of marriage or partnership. Her topic is called bringing companion animals pets, into the conversation on pet custody. So the floor is yours now. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and I appreciate the invitation to this conference. Um, so yeah, as um, the kind introduction said, I have been an animal law lawyer for over 20 years and um, this area of pet custody is of particular interest to me because um, it touches on a lot of different areas related to animal law. And um, I'm just gonna take you through um, a few things here. I'm gonna, um, just a second here, yeah, okay. I'm gonna take you through just a little bit more about my background and how that impacts what I do. Um, so I originally came from Africa and I've always had companion animals at home. Even before I was a baby, we had companion animals at home. And um, I think this makes um, a person understand animals from a young age and also to empathize with animals, which is really, really important from a practitioner's point of view and also to understand your clients. So that's something that's really important. Um, and I teach animal law at um, two universities in Vancouver, and um, I'm very engaged in the field, and including, um, I do a lot of media interviews, I write about animal law, and I have an outreach program, which if we have time, depending on how the questions go, I'm going to show a video about the outreach program that I do called Pause of Empathy, um, and that's where I teach animal law in schools with dogs. So uh, a particular passion of mine. Okay, I also want to do a land acknowledgement um, because um, I am on the um, unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations land where I'm presenting from here in Vancouver to you in Europe. It's, uh, by the way, everybody, it's 6 a.m. my time. And so you guys are like winding down, kind of. You've been at the conference all day. I've only just recently woken up. <laughs> um, but anyways, so my impact here, I got to move my slides over a little bit because I see, or can I do that? Hang on, oopsie. Um, maybe I can't. I just, I'm seeing part of my slide is cut off to the right. So I want to move my screen. How do I move my slide over to the left, Monica, a little bit? Because I see the gallery view, and then I can't see part of my slide is cut off. Um, you can change the gallery view. Um, I think okay. it's like up and okay. right. Okay. Yeah, or you I can see move it. it. Okay, I can move the gallery a bit over to. Yeah. Just trying to. I was. I thought I could reorient my slide a little bit, but. Um, Okay, that's a, that's a slight bit better. Um, yeah, okay. we, well, we see it well, so it should you, be okay. Yeah, I, I'm reading off of the screen and, I, and I'm kind of cut off at part of it, but anyway, we can deal, I can deal with that from my hard copy as well. So Perfect. anyway, today's theme is basically, um, you know, in part of the conference theme is animals in crisis. And so in exploring the critical engagement with animals in society and how they're treated, particularly for my purposes today, um, I'm looking at it in a dissolution of marriage like relationship. But um, some of my early cases for this um, came out of um, roommates splitting up. And it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a situation where people have been married. It can be any two people 
who are claiming ownership slash custody of a dog or a cat or any other animal, horse. Um, so I'm going to go through Pet Custody in Canada a little bit about um, some US examples because as usual in North America, the US, I'd say in most areas of animal law is further ahead than we are here. So in Canada, and um, I also want to talk about something that comes in here. It's called the violence link. Okay. So uh, what is animal law? My definition is super simple. It's just any time a domestic or wild animal intersects with the law. Can be, you know, we could have people debating and seeing what it is, but this is to me a definition that works very well because there's so many ways that an, a domestic animal could intersect with the law as as is the same with a wild animal so marriages end frequently so 40 percent of the time so according to our statistics canada data marriages end in divorce so when the marriage ends what happens with the family pet and it can become a flashpoint issue, something that people decide they're gonna fight over, very similar to like they're gonna fight over children. Um, um, except for there's not a lot of case law in this area of pet custody. And there are some small variations on rulings, but mainly it's a straightforward property analysis that is what the judges use as their formula for how to settle these cases. The other thing is, um, uh, like all areas of animal law, many of these cases have settled privately, and so they are not reported in the case law. So you won't you won't see them showing up. Um, so it's important to see that historically animals have been treated as property, and this ownership concept forms the basis of all of our animal laws. Same thing in Europe, right? Um, this is this pretty much a universal concept and we see that human and non-human animals interests are intertwined and they have been for hundreds of years but it's always with the humans on top and as the superior species with the attenuating rights and the animals are down below because they're mere property so I say that for the most part, we don't have a very harmonious interspecies relationship with animals outside of our families. Sure, you love your family, dogs and cats, but you know, the conflicts that take place when people meet other people's animals are, are growing right now, especially during COVID. Um, so how does the court decide who gets custody of a pet when a partner when a partnership splits up, a romantic partnership. Um, so again, family pets are considered to be personal or matrimonial property, and they're subject to equitable division according to the uh, property law principles and our Divorce Act and our Family Law Acts. And the court applies a property ownership test rather than a best interest test of the child. So, um, animals are not going to be treated the same way as children in court and the question the court is asking is who is the rightful owner either via purchasing or receiving the pet as a gift so this is to say generally it happens this way but there have been some variations um, we had a really really great decision in 2011 um, in Canada, probably one of the best animal law decisions ever decided in all of North America, written by the Chief Justice of Alberta. She wrote the dissent. So there, it was a three panel appeal um, and um, she wrote the dissent. So this is a quote from the dissent of that case called Reese. And it was about an elephant who um, was in the Edmont, still is in the Edmonton Zoo. So she says, the past 250 years have seen a significant evolution in the law relating to animals, though admittedly not as far as might many might consider warranted. And it's important when you are looking at these cases for looking at the framework. So that's why whenever I teach this area as well, I always take people through a little bit of the history to see why the court is where it is 
and that will enable people who are practitioners or advocates to see where they might have an inroad. So I cite this case. I, this, this case had nothing to do with, with pet custody at all. Like I said, it's about a zoo elephant and a zoo elephant um, ultimately trying to make her way to a sanctuary. But people might say, what does that have to do with it? It's the language of the dissenting judge that I find super useful. And for example, I was able to use that case um, when I was arguing in our top court in BC for a dangerous dog case. Again, nothing to do with dogs specifically, but the language of this case, especially the dissent is so powerful that it can be used across a number of cases. Um, so at least 50% of all Canadian households have at least one pet and I think it's very clear that all the statistics and the surveys show that pets are thought to be an integral part of many Canadian families. And the Canadian Animal Health Institute conducted a 2018 survey to show that we have about 8.2 million dogs and 8.3 million cats in our homes. And um, the survey overwhelmingly felt from that the family pet was truly a member of the family. And I think this has changed a little bit over time. Um, and the statistics bear this out too, that, um, you know, before it used to just be the family pet at home, but now people are seeing it sometimes as a replacement for children as well. That's another factor that's become more common. And 90% of society use the word family when describing pets. Um, so 61% of Canadians own a pet. 44% of millennials see pets as practice for children. And married people are 34% more likely to own a pet. So I've got a little question and answer um, page here about whether or not, um, how, there's, how does the specific legislation deal with the family pet and divorce? It doesn't. There's no specific legislation that currently deals with the concept of pet custody and divorce. Um, are pets going to be considered children or like children under the Family um, Law Act? No. Um, how does the law basically treat the family pet as property? The law states that each spouse is entitled to family property, regardless of the spouse's use or contribution. On separation, each spouse has a right to an undivided half interest in all family property as a tenant in common, meaning any property that is owned is divided on a 50-50 basis. And so pets are thrown in with um, the division of the television, furniture, and cars, which to me is nonsensical because, of course, animals are sentient. It makes no sense. Um, this is this is part of the problem of treating animals as property. You see, it comes out in the legislation and in the case law. Um, will a court order joint access to the family pet? Generally, no, but there have been exceptions in cases going back all the way to 1980 and prior to that as well. So the court you know, generally the court wants finality. So that is what a major reason why they don't want to have um, joint access to the family pet because um, courts don't want to be supervising ongoing custody like they do for children. Um, so um, pets interests are kind of taken into account sometimes, but not usually in um, a dissolution of marriage. But um, this is what I suggest to people when they come to me is I say, well, we could do a private settlement and um, that way the parties have control as to how they want to um, treat their family pet. So we have had um, joint custody arrangements that we've set up where we've had, um, you know, somebody says, well, I can have the pet for two weeks. My ex-spouse can have them for another two. And that's actually worked pretty well but those are not ratified by the court. So pets may be family members at home, but in, this is actually a little bit backwards, but in the law, they are property. There's no question that people treat their family member, pet and child 
I think very similarly, but the law doesn't see it that way. Now I'm gonna take you through an article that I wrote for um, one of our lawyer uh, magazines called The Lawyer's Daily that's published by a big uh, publishing firm called LexisNexis. And it's called Creativity is Called For in Dog and Cat Custody Battles. So I'm gonna read from it. Um, Pet custody inquiries at my downtown Vancouver animal law firm are up, and I suspect the upward trend will continue as we emerge from COVID-19. There's been a lot of forced confinement due to the epidemic, and news reports indicate that a surge in divorce filings are anticipated. So splitting up includes the family pet. What happens to the family pet upon dissolution of the human relationship? Who gets to keep the pet after the split? Can sharing, joint custody, intermittent access in some form be ordered by the courts? So I talk about taking on pet custody cases since 2000 when I first started practicing animal law in Vancouver. And over the years, I've advised on so many of these cases. Um, the distinct pattern and similarity that um, is shown in the case law is that people value their pet like a family member, but the law doesn't. And in fact, even using the term, as I say in this article, even using the term pet custody is not what the court's going to use. The court doesn't use the word pet custody. That's my term. The court does not necessarily apply that. So courts usually see these cases as best ownership claims because animals are held to be property under the law. However, they can and sometimes are looked upon the courts as sentient property. And I say there is room for creativity. Many courts are applying a straightforward formula of whoever owns the pet gets to keep the pet, but it depends. So pet custody or pet ownership cases are a bit of a hodgepodge depending on the court and the province, but courts in several regions of Canada going back as far as 40 years have found jurisdiction on which party should keep the pet and have joint custody or intermittent access. And um, there's another article that I've written that I showed the link to there that you know, some courts most certainly express some recognition that a pet is akin to or is a family member. Um, so it's interesting that several years ago when I was first invited to teach animal law at our main law school in BC, um, at UBC, I was um, requested, I suggested that actually we should add pet custody as a new section to our curriculum to reflect the importance in this growing area because it, it wasn't on the curriculum. So one of the cases we discussed then and now is a very old case, a 1980 Ontario case called Rogers where the divorcing couple, they fought tooth and claw over possession of their beloved dog, Damon. And somewhat progressively for the times, the court in Rogers provided a sort of sharing to allow Damon to remain, um, with bo in, in both ex-spouses' lives. The court stated that the dog's feelings needed to be accounted for, canvas best interests and affection in determining possession on or access. The Rogers case aptly makes the point that joint possession, ostensibly joint custody of an animal in one form or another, and the factoring of the best interests of the family dog is possible. So over the 40 years since it was decided, Rogers has been cited in pet custody cases, including a 2012 Ontario case about a Chihuahua called Princess and her trio of puppies. And um, this McLean Baudet versus Belanger, um, the court quoted from that Rogers decision stating, this court has jurisdiction in any action for the recovery of possession of personal property. In Rogers, the court addressed the issue of vesting ownership and permanent possession of a dog in a matrimonial dispute. The court found that the main consideration in determining the issue is not the best interest of the dog, but the preservation of the dog as personal property, having regard to its breed, its characteristics and traits, etc. But the court emphasized that the best interest of the dog is still a, con a consideration. So on this point, the court stated, in holding that the best interest of the dog is not the prime consideration, I am mindful that a dog has feelings, is capable of affection, needs to be shown affection, 
and that its affection can be alienated, that it needs and its needs must be provided for, and that generally it must be treated humanely with all due care and attention to its needs. And these factors are to be considered as well in determining the right to possession or access. So it's not like the court is bending over backwards to say um, we're applying this um, you know, best interest, but they are factoring it in. And that's, that's really important. And like I said, that's a very old case, 40 years ago. So Govan uh, versus Schaefer is one of my favorite pet custody cases. And one I mention whenever I teach pet custody, it's a laudable case for making an indent into the idea of thinking of animals beyond respirating property. So back in 2003, um, Canadian newspaper headlines read variations such as court orders couple share custody of a dog in the wake of this Saskatchewan court ordering joint custody of a pet for a couple because it was you know still quite rare so it made headlines. Um, the Govan case showcased an understanding of dogs, jurisdiction, and the best interests of the family pet. The court even went so far as to say that the man and woman were members of his pack directing that they must share their handsome white husky, Shikido, equally. The former couple would share Shikido week on week off for the rest of his canine life, and the court heartwarmingly referred to the intrinsic nature of the relationship between a dog and his humans. The judge em em empathically stated about Shikido, even if his value of $150 could be claimed as exempt from distribution under section 23. His real value is much higher and founded in the intrinsic nature of the relationship which he has formed with the other members of his pack, the plaintiff and the defendant over his lifetime. The fair and equitable order is that the possession of Shikido be shared equally by the plaintiff and by the defendant. That regime is in accordance with the way that Shikido was treated by the plaintiff and the defendant during their cohabitation their marriage, and most of their separation. So joint custody of family pet cases, although not new in many provinces, remain outlier cases at the moment. Cases like Govan do show how Canadian courts can sometimes have, um, they've claimed jurisdiction and also applied the best interests of the animal in pet custody cases. And then um, in part two of this article and in part two of this talk, we're going to talk about Canada's leading 2018 case in pet custody. So I asked this question, what are the difficulties that flow from a strict property analysis of the family pet? And I say, where, where do I start to answer this question? Because <laughs> This is, this is the, the problem. This, this is the nub, the main area that I have difficulty in almost all areas of animal law um, because a property analysis fails to account for the sentience of unique animals who, the animals themselves have preferences, they have needs, they have capacities, they love. There's not just the bond between the human and the pet, there's the bond between the two pets if you have more than one pet at home. So there are all kinds of relationships to take into account here when we're looking at this. Um, and one thing that is um, difficult for animal lawyers to understand is that um, there's this current um, that in, when you go into court, um, animals are given kind of a reluctant view insofar as the court may think, this is valuable court time. We could be dealing with issues related to people and not related just to animals alone. And so they say that, you know, um, animals really, um, you'll, you'll kind of be met with this spoken and unspoken ethos that these cases are a waste of time. And that's something that I've had to fight over um, kind of more mentally in my mind about showing that, no, you know, animals really do matter. Um, and so, again, to answer this question about the difficulties that flow from our property analysis, if something is property, it doesn't have rights. And I mean, it's an it without rights. If something, if someone has standing, then they have rights. 
And so to my clients that walk in to, to come in and see me, every single one of them will say that their pet is their family, not a thing and ought to have rights, but the law has to catch up still. So could pets, could animals be a kind of sentient property in pet custody cases in the future? I say most likely yes. So, you know, my, I always say animals are not things. Animals are not, an animal is not the equivalent of a lamp, but currently in law, that's kind of the case. So the leading case in Canada on pet custody is Baker versus Harmina. And that was from the Newfoundland Court of Appeal. And um, this is a case that has a specific lens aimed at the dissent. That's, that's, that's why I've used this case study. Um, again, it's not the main judges deciding um, where I'm going with this. It's the dissent that I'm actually looking at. So a couple, a romantic couple, purchased a Bernese mountain dog named Maya. And she was treated like their child for a couple of years. They split up and then they litigated. Who was going to keep her? So at the first level of court, the small claims judge said, a straightforward property analysis, Maya was owned by Mr. Baker because he paid for her. Dogs are personal property. And he said, yep, Mr. Baker, you have Maya. Miss Harmina appealed to the next level of court which progressively stated that the small claims judge failed to properly consider the full context of the relationship and held that Maya was owned by both parties and set up a custody schedule. Mr. Baker appealed. And Mr. Baker's appeal to the Court of Appeal succeeded and two out of three judges on the appellate bench agreed that Mr. Baker was the sole owner. Um, so basically, the court of first instance in applying a strict property analysis was correct. Um, and the majority um, was written by Justice White, and he said, in the eyes of the law, a dog is an item of personal property. That doesn't mean dogs aren't important. It means that when two people disagree about who should get a dog, the question is not who has the most affection for the dog or treats it better so long as both parties treat the dog humanely? The question is, who owns it? So the appeal court admitted that the legal system is not well equipped to deal with the problems raised by joint ownership. And um, they didn't want to endorse a joint custody plan. But the dissent, Justice Hogue, um, has some amazing language on pet custody. She talks about um, how ownership of a dog is a much more complicated, uh, dis it's more, as she says, I'm gonna quote her, ownership of a dog is more complicated to decide than say a car or a piece of furniture. It is not as though animate property like a dog is a divisible asset, she wrote. The ownership of a dog is a more complex and nuanced question than the ownership of say a bicycle. And Justice Hogue was commenting on the ownership test and that it ought not to be as simplistic as who bought the dog. And then she says, I must say something more. I am disturbed by the notion that the courts should not spend their precious time and resources determining the ownership of dogs. In this regard, she emphasized the emotional bonds between people and their dogs. And she talked about how um, you know, the courts constantly are dealing with somebody arguing over who keeps the BMW. You know, why do we fight over cars? And we give judicial resources and time to fighting over cars, but we won't do that for animate um, animals. So the dissent has some really great language um, taking into account the human animal bond. And um, she calls pets animate property, which is really key to my notions of understanding animal law. And I quoted this case also in our BC Court of Appeal um, for a, a dog case that had nothing to do with custody. Um, because for me, um, these cases show us about access to justice for animals and showing that it's justifiable, it's important. So in my view, the dissent in Baker could give weight to pet custody battles of the future. And, um, and I say it's an uphill climb and it's clear that the law has yet to change from viewing 
pets as personal property for the most part. But the strong dissents in Baker and in the Reese case about Lucy the elephant, they open the door to a potentially more holistic approach to issues like this in the future. So a very recent um, Superior Court case in Ontario called King v. Mann, the um, Superior Court considered Baker and this case was about a personal property dispute which two estranged romantic partners who had a history of domestic violence and conflict sought to divide their assets. The applicant claimed um, their shared dog was a gift from the respondent and the respondent denied it. And um, the court said, notwithstanding the universal agreement in the case law that dogs being sentient beings are a special, important and unique category of personal property, for the purposes of practicality and expediency, the law continues to hold that disputes over dogs are to be approached in the same manner as any other personal property. Namely, the relevant question is ownership. So that's directly out of Baker. Um, and you know, the court also wanted to note that the applicant spending time with the dog or money on the dog or caring for the dog doesn't constitute a change in ownership. So Baker is widely followed in Canada, and I'm just taking you sort of to a couple of cases coast to coast like this. This is a case from my province of British Columbia Superior Court case, um, where the, um, the court follows the Baker decision again, the, the majority of course, in applying an ownership test for, for who owned two dogs in a dispute. Um, and this was relating to a municipality. Um, so this was, a little bit different than um, two people fighting over their dog, it was a municipality. Um, but the city refused um, to um, return the dog saying that they had validly accepted the dogs from one of the co-owners. And um, again, the court relied on Baker to articulate the core issue, which was a property interest. And um, so this claim was framed as the wrongful possession of property. And the court just said, no, pets are a variant of personal property. And concern for dogs welfare does factor into the decision, but it's still about ownership. So um, lower court decisions and tribunals in Canada may be starting to change the tone around pet custody. There's some really great language um, from the Maritimes uh, province called Nova Scotia, where uh, an adjudicator says, in a more perfect world, there would be special laws recognizing pets as living, feeling creatures with rights to be looked after by those who best meet their needs or interests. And there would be specialized accessible courts to determine the best interests of the dog, as there are for children in the family courts. And that was a 2017 um, case about a dog called Lily. So giving animals a voice in the conversation as we try to move to harmonious interspecies relations. I think it's trite to say, but animals need to have a voice and for them to have a voice, they also need to have standing. They need to be able to get into the courtroom. And I found that um, just cases I've done and reading the case law, that some judges struggle harder than others to move toward a best interest test and away from a straight up property analysis. But even then, the voice of the animal is not usually heard. Um, and as I said earlier, many jurists still see animal law as frivolous. Um, and I think that this legal mindset needs to shift. Um, and sometimes we see it can, um, but not that often. Um, so, I think we've gone through a lot of this sort of stuff, but here's some of the factors the court will look at to see who has a better ownership claim. Who bought the pet? Whose name is on the bill of sale or the adoption paper? Who cares for the pet most days? Who takes the pet to the vet? Whose name is the pet registered under? Who pays for the pet, for example, at the pet store? All of these things. Um, who takes the pet to the groomer? Um, Where's the pet been living since separation? These are some of the factors. So when I advise my clients, I like to ask these questions, you know, what's been going on since the separation? Um, and the thing is, is that these uh, considerations, they're overly simplistic. They don't account for the needs of the pet as having his or her own intrinsic worth. 
But these questions are a starting point because they do take into account that the ownership of a pet is more nuanced than a family computer or as the Court of Appeal said, um, a bicycle. So even incrementally chipping away at notions of property is still helpful and moving the law closer to equitable principles. So I've done up this chart. Um, I call this the Canadian Companion Animal Continuum Chart. And so at the top, you have um, animate property. That's the worst outcome. Um, inanimate, pardon me, inanimate property, the absolute worst outcome. And then at the bottom, you have the intrinsic rights model, and that's the greatest autonomy. That's the best. Um, and somewhere in the middle, in red there, special kind of property, sentient animate property. I think that's an achievable outcome to have um, animals decided uh, in these cases as a special kind of property. Now, shifting gears to pet custody in the States, USA. Um, I say that we can learn a lot from US pet custody cases because one, they litigate way more than I think any other country in the world because it's the States and they have more pet custody cases there. Um, a 2014 national survey by the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers found 88% of pet custody fights um, relate to dogs, 5% cats and horses 1%. The interesting part for me is the 6% included an iguana, a python and 130 pound turtle. So there are different animals that come into play for, like I said, it's not just cats and dogs. Um, so in the States, pets are considered to be personal property, but courts have considered the best interests of the pet in determining who gets custody of them. And three states, Alaska, Illinois, and California, have specific laws that address pet custody when a marriage dissolves. They have also awarded shared custody, visitation, and alimony to the pet owner. I find the California pet custody um, statute has some really helpful ideas. So while pets are not considered children and they're still property, the California law recognizes what it calls a pet's unique nature. It sets up special assessments that judges can use to determine custody in contested cases. Spouses can petition for custody of a pet and this empowers a judge to take into consideration the care of the pet when determining sole or joint ownership. Questions like who walked the dog, who took the cat to the vet appointments in determining custody. And um, only Alaska and Illinois have similar statutes, both of which took effect in the last few years. Um, the California law, to, I believe, is the most detailed and other states are eyeing that as a model in the rest of the states. Um, not all states, some. Pets and kids um, often shift together as a package. So for example, if they say, um, the human child is going to go to the man this weekend, then the, the pet goes with. So they'll have the kid and the pet shift as a, a group. And um, so that's what they've started to do. It's an, and the, the person who sponsored this bill um, in the Illinois State Senate said, it sort of starts treating your animals more like children. So these cases are recognizing animals as sentient individuals Going back to that chart that I was showing, you're basically seeing them in the red zone, which is where I hope to go in Canada too. So um, here's another thing that comes up in the context of pet custody. And COVID-19 has highlighted this link of violence, abuse women, and their shared harm, the shared vulnerabilities, and um, it's called the link. So this has really gotten worse in COVID. If, if a woman loves an animal, they are often targeted by an abuser or weaponized because of confinement during COVID-19. So as I said before, when I was reading my pet custody article, this link um, of violence on animals and humans is very strong. It's gone up in COVID and so have pet adoptions uh, soared during COVID. 
and animals are used for companionship for women, for children. And we've seen an increase in violence in both animals and pets. And part of this, you might wonder why is this in the context of this conversation is because it comes up in pet custody. You have to sometimes see that women are affected in this way. And um, so there's no question. Go ahead. But uh, the presentation time is about to end, end and we have the time for Q&A. Oh, okay. So maybe I give you two more minutes or something. Sure. Yeah, sure. That's, that's perfect. Um, so um, I will, I, basically, I guess people, are people going to look at the slides later then? Well, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. So um, I will just say that, so protection of humans and animals is intertwined. And like, for example, 100 years ago, our SPCAs in Canada gave assistance to women, children, and animals. And um, yeah, I wanted to show this video. Um, I don't know how I can do, I, I, if I click on this, I don't know if it'll work. Let's see if it will. We'll see. Yeah, it is, okay. This is where, this is how I, this is an ad. Thank you. <laughs> Pause of Empathy is a program that I developed to teach compassion to kids using a dog in a classroom. So I based a lot of my ideas on the Dalai Lama, actually, um, starting very big there. But um, the Dalai Lama was talking about a program called Roots of Empathy, which uh, uses a baby to come into a classroom and explain empathy and teaches compassion, caring, uh, we social that with you. literacy. And Thanks. I figured a few years ago, I've got to make this work in the classroom setting. I've been an active volunteer in schools for almost 10 years, and I thought this is, this is a great thing to do, to try and teach kids how to become socialized and better citizens. I became an animal lawyer in the year 2000 after I'd been practicing for a couple of years. I had a great opportunity when a woman who was Beastie's pioneer in animal law, Kristen Tilquist, was moving to California, and she said, would you like to acquire my practice? I said, absolutely because it married my notions of love of animals with my love of law. So everybody can't believe there's such a discipline area, but it's actually a very serious area of law. I think people kind of think, well, it's not just all about fluffy bunnies and cute cats and dogs. It's about serious issues as well. I mean, a death of your pet is gonna affect you in a very serious way. So if your dog is accused of being a dangerous dog, you're gonna need help from an animal law lawyer. And it's a very serious matter indeed, as is veterinary malpractice and farmed animal cases. They actually touch on some very big societal issues at the same time as protecting a disenfranchised group. So the reason I'm showing that video in the context of this presentation Pause of empathy is, is because this is how I think we move towards harmonious interspecies relations from the ground up when you teach very young children. So um, it looks like we're kind of getting out of time. I, um, that's my concluding slide. But um, courts still uniformly see pets in the property paradigm, but it's overdue now for the law to reconsider pets above property and to incorporate their voices so that we can have access to justice for animals. Thank you. So I am happy to take okay, thank you questions. So yeah. yeah, so I'll start with the first one. Um, in countries uh, whose legal systems do not have precedence on the ruling that consider dogs more than property, what can you do to facilitate such a decision? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the, the part of the question. In, in countries where? Uh, whose legal systems do not have precedence on a ruling that considered dogs more than oh. property. Ah, wow. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, where you don't have a precedent to go on, how do you start? How do you become that first case 
in effect. Um, I, I would suggest, um, depending on where that person is, to look at case law from other countries. And hopefully it would be persuasive for the judges to see, you know, I'm in France, let's say, um, and we don't have any decisions on point, but I have this really great decision from Germany that the courts in France might accept as a similar situation, you know, or to look at something in the States. I always actually point people towards the States just because, and when I say the States, everybody knows I mean America. Um, that's where I, I say people should look. Um, for getting an idea of some of the language and try and adopt some of the language into their argument. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. And uh, next question is, uh, do you think that shared custody is a good option for pets welfare wise uh, since they have to ch change the environment often? Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, I think that when you're looking at a situation where children have to move back and forth and shuttle back and forth, it's really important. For example, that's very hard on cats. Cats are creatures of their home and they don't want to be shifted. I'm pretty sure this would not work very well for a cat. Um, so sometimes it isn't the best. I agree with you, uh, the questioner, um, in saying, you know, it isn't necessarily the best option to have um, that kind of joint um, custody where the animal moves back and forth. It might be better for that ex-spouse to be able to come into the house and visit at the other person's house because you have to take into account what are the needs of the animal first and foremost, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and the next question is, if uh, pet custody laws advance, would it also help advance the cause of farmed animals? Or could it uh, inadvertently widen the gap between pet uh, animals and farm animals? Oh, yeah, great question. And, you know, there is, um, huh, there's a lot of debate, uh, a, lot, a big philosophical debate that really the animals that we should be um, advocating and litigating for are the farmed animals because they are so affected and in greatest numbers, right? Farmed animals and research animals. Um, they are the most widely killed and used for human purposes. So some people might say, well, why are you doing things for companion animals? I'll tell you. There is a trickle down effect that I believe will start to happen that will benefit all animals because it's so important not to ignore farmed animals. And they are getting a greater and greater voice. And um, they're not often the subject of litigation, but they're becoming more so, especially in America. Good question. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. Okay, so sure. Uh, is there a specific Animal Protection Act in Canada? Are animals treated like things under the Canadian law? Are they recognized as sentient beings? Well, by and large, well, we have so many, because we have um, under our provincial laws and we have many, many provinces, we have decided um, through our governance that each province is in charge of property laws and almost I, I think uniformly across the board, animals are going to be considered property. In Quebec, they have put in words like sentient beings. I think that was in 2015. But I haven't seen a whole change in the law just because they're named as such. So um, I think by and large, we're still looking at the straight up formula of animals as property. Although that's, we're chipping away at it. So thank you very much for the presentation and for the answers also. It was very, very interesting. Well. And people can see this slide. They can feel free to keep in touch, to reach out to me. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions offline as well.
if people have um, concerns or ideas they want to share. We also linked your video. Um, so they have the link in the chat. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Bye.